bit is going to come in. Thank you. Steadily coming to bring us the word of God. If you've got your Bibles with you, would you turn with me please to Ephesians chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 14 through to 21. When I heard that um, I was going to read this this morning, I said to Nick on Friday during our prayer time, what an amazing passage this is. Because this is Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. And I believe it's the prayer for all believers as well. Because as you read it, ponder upon it, it just thrills your heart to know that this is God's word for this generation. A prayer for the Ephesians, for everything that's gone before, Paul writes, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasseth knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Father, we thank you for Chris, and we thank you that you have anointed her to bring this word to us this morning. Uh, Lord, we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you will uh, strengthen her as she uh, brings what it is you want to say to us. And Lord, open our hearts and our ears to hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's get all the tech done first. Make sure I've got everything on. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Lovely to see you all. And uh, good morning, everybody on the on Zoom over there. Right. So let's begin. It's the first day of Advent this Sunday, as we as we know. And what better time to remind us of God's amazing love and power? Advent in a time when we prepare to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ and to prepare for his second coming. Yes, so let's have a quick recap. In the beginning of chapter 3, Paul breaks off from his prayer to explain that Israel had struggles with the mystery of how God was going to bring salvation. This plan was revealed to all through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
and that through God's amazing grace and wisdom, all mankind, Jew and Gentile, can experience this salvation and reconciliation, that we have all been adopted into God's family, and that all creation here on earth and in the heavenly realms are all brought together under Jesus' sacrifice, that we are all God's treasure, his trophy, to display his grace and his glory. So now Paul returns back to the reason why and what he is praying for at the beginning of the letter. You will note that Paul says, For this reason I kneel before the Father. Why put that down? What does it matter what position he is in? In that day, people used to pray standing. They say, think of the great wailing wall in Jerusalem where faithful Jewish men go to pray. Here Paul is expressing a deep emotion, a reverence. He also calls God Father, echoing how Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6 and in Luke 11, beginning the Lord's Prayer with our Father. No human religion or Jewish teacher would actually dare to call the supreme being, the creator of all, Father or Daddy. We are to understand that it's not so much how we pray, but that is important, but who we are praying to. In fact, he goes on to remind us that we are all from the Father, and we are his children, and therefore can pray to him in confidence. We, his church, are family, reflecting the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, to this broken, damaged world. As the church, we should show the world that what family is like and are called to support families that are damaged by abuse, addiction, lies and rejection. Churches are where the ill, the grieving, the lonely, the broken should find their family. So what is he praying for so emotionally and reverently? For power. Well, power brings up all sorts of connotations. Superheroes with amazing capes. Mighty armies with powerful weapons of destruction. Or oh, natural elements like tornadoes and the mighty winds and powerful winds within it. But no, this is not the power he's talking about. He's talking about a much more powerful power. The power of the Holy Spirit that is work within our inner being, our spirit. So that firstly we can be a dwelling place for Jesus. Secondly, that we are able to grasp or comprehend Christ's love for us all. And thirdly, to know that the power it, that of this power that is with work within us. So let's unpack this first statement. <coughs> Verse 16 to 17 says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. A dwelling place. When we make that decision to be followers of Christ, the Holy Spirit fills us. But Paul is not just talking about a little visit that makes us feel amazing. When John and I moved into our bungalow over 30 years ago, it needed a lot doing to it. Windows needed replacing, an extension needed to be built, old carpets thrown out and replaced. And over a long period of time, it's, it has been changed so that it is fit for purpose for our family to live in. Now we have a home that we have built over many years, but it's still not finished. As our lives and our circumstances change, our home has to change too. Someone said it takes a lifetime to make a home. Jesus doesn't want to make that occasional visit into our hearts. He wants a permanent place of residence there. 
When we visit someone's home, we don't make changes. In fact, some of us don't even get on pat. But Jesus wants to stay in our hearts, not as a visitor, but as a permanent resident, to settle there. By staying there, he will change us, little by little, slowly, slowly. Old wallpaper of selfishness, he will replace with new wallpaper of love. Filthy carpets stained with immorality, he will change with fresh carpets of purity and kindness. And that old rickety furniture of idolatry and rebellion for solid furniture for new ministries to serve and worship Jesus. Paul doesn't pray for power that the Ephesians will become wealthy or famous, but they will become holy and clean, renewed hearts, a fitting place for Jesus to settle down in. He goes on in verses 17 via 19, it says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ and to know his love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. There's so much here to, uh, to unpack. So I'm just going to give you a few points to think on and then perhaps during the week you'll think about it or discuss it in your discipleship groups. Being rooted and established in love. Jesus is whom we need to be rooted in. But what does that mean? A plant has roots that go into the soil. From there it gets all that it needs to grow, to flourish, to survive. In the same way through Jesus and his love for us, by his sacrifice, we need to get everything from him. He supports us, encourages us, and feeds us. Not just for the short term, but forever. It really is all about him. And you will notice that we are to grasp this love not just by ourselves, but with each other. I became a Christian in the 70s, and unfortunately, there was a big emphasis on personal salvation, which, yes, there is personal salvation. And I've had many people tell me that you can be a Christian and do it yourself. No need to go to church or be involved with other Christians. Well, if you take what, Jesus, what Paul says on board here, and in many other scriptures in the Bible, that view is not in line with what God wants for us. <clears throat> he has called us to be a body, working together, encouraging each other. God has always talked about gathering his people, not just individuals. He has always been about loving relationships, which reflects him being the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We are to know the full measure of Jesus' love for us together with the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul then tries to help us understand Jesus' love by trying to give us some dimensions. He says, to know how wise his love is. Christ has accepted all, Jew or Gentile, Near or far, no one is beyond his loving reach. No matter what you have done, or continue to do, or not do, he will accept you. To know how long his love is, his lasting love, before we ever became into being, to the present, to eternity, his love is for the long run he keeps his promise he will never leave us or forsake us no matter how often we fail he's fully committed to his people how high his love is 
His exalting love. We're not just saved from going to hell, but we are lifted up to heaven. Ephesians 2, 6-7 says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. We need to grasp how high the love of Christ is and how much he has in store for us in eternity. And to know his deep love, his sacrificial love. Love not only endured the most humiliating, most physically agonising death for us, but also the most spiritually anguish and separation from his father <coughs> on our behalf. How often do we glibly say, Jesus died for me, isn't that wonderful? And it is. But do we really take on board what it took? What it really means? I think if we're honest, we sometimes take it for granted. <coughs> Jesus knows this too, that we will take him for granted. But he still did it for us because of his deep love for us. We need to be rooted in Jesus' love. We need through the Holy Spirit to grasp even a little of the dimension of his love for us all. Together, and he wants us to know his love that surpasses knowledge. So how do we do that? I love being in creation, being on the beach, being in the woods, or just in my garden. I know a little about it over the years, I've gleaned, but I don't know about nature fully. Does that stop me from enjoying it? No, of course it doesn't. But every day I learn a little more about it, be it the name of an insect. I had an interesting thing about earwigs. Did you know that earwigs have got wings shaped as ears? That's why they're called earwigs. Isn't that amazing? Didn't know that. <laughs> or the movement of a bird or just the beauty of a flower. I don't have to know all about it to love it, but by learning more and more day by day, it just confirms how much I do love it, and more I want to know about it. It's the same with God. The more we pray to him, allow the Holy Spirit to change us, the more we learn to love him even just that little bit that we can comprehend. Paul is encouraging us to pray confidently to God so that we will know him more and therefore his love for ourselves and for us and for others. And lastly, verse 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. Paul is reminding us again that it is all about Jesus working within us. We can't make ourselves a suitable place for Jesus to live in. Only his power can do that. We can't grasp how much he loves us. Only his Holy Spirit in us can do that. His power is all-powerful, immeasurable, has no limits. Jesus loves us as we are, but he loves us so much more to keep us there. His power is in work in each one of us who believes in him transforming us little by little into the people he wants us to be, his church. His glory throughout generations forever and ever. 
So on this first Sunday of Advent, we can reflect on God's love and power for us in this season. His wide love brought shepherds from the nearby fields to worship him, but also wise men from afar to bring glory to God. His long love that had been prophesied about him long before Jesus arrived on earth as a baby. Israel, Israel, sorry, Isaiah 9 verse 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His high love saw angels proclaiming glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. Luke 2, 14. <coughs> and his deep love displayed to us as God laid his deity down he became a little human baby fragile and vulnerable. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. In John 1.14 it says, to dwell with his creation he made, to grow and live a perfect life, so that 33 years later, he would die for us all, so that we can live. What power. <laughs>